We're going to try, but the uh, uh, acting mayor uh, runs committee meetings. Um, and we're going to see how that goes. And our acting mayor of the day is uh, Councillor Chris Wilson, so it might not go that well, but we'll see. <laughs> so I haven't even called the meeting to order yet. Well, you didn't give me my little cheat sheet. <laughs> Call the meeting to order. <laughs> He's good. Good so far. <laughs> yeah, way better than the last guy. <laughs> and we're on time. Not. That, that was a better handoff than I was getting from the previous. <laughs> um, Any additions to the agenda? Oh, let me see. No. None. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Our first item then is the minutes of this committee's meeting of January 12th. Recommendation to approve. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried? Um, Point okay. of order. Never get to do that. Our, our first report of staff from the Engineering and Public Works Department uh, concerns Per Coquitlam's East of Fremont Cedar Drive Alignment Study Coquitlam response. We've been sure comments by the City Manager, followed by a presentation by the General Manager and the Manager of Transportation Planning. The reports before you for information. I, I just wanted to uh, make a general comment uh, that uh, this is in response to Park Coquitlam's request for feedback so that they can continue on with uh, a process that they are conducting. All I wanted to say is that I want to take the larger view in mind and keep all of our uh, potential transportation issues with Park Coquitlam in mind when we go to this specific one. Uh, we have a number of projects coming up in the future, including uh, Lincoln, Victoria, and a number of others. Uh, and it's my belief that we have to look at all of them holistically with respect to cost sharing and those kind of things. So we're doing a bit of background work on that. Uh, but in the meantime, they've asked for specific feedback on this specific project, and uh, Joseph is going to be taking it from there. Thank you. So um, yeah. we, we have prepared, obviously, a report for you, which is fairly detailed and has um, quite a bit of the background information and also uh, potentially a recommended uh, direction where staff, based on technical uh, factors, would like to go. Uh, there is some time sensitivity to this issue because the city of Port Coquitlam tomorrow night will have a public meeting on this topic and they requested us uh, that if at all possible they want to have our feedback prior to them going into this public meeting. So um, for, for ease, uh, we just prepared a couple of slides literally to show you uh, the alignment options which are being, uh, which are being considered by um, the city of Fort Popitlam. Now, a couple of uh, overarching uh, pieces of information which Council may find uh, on one hand uh, important and uh, on the other hand also um, informative. We are dealing with an area where today there is no grid system, uh, or not well enough developed grid system for the road network. We are dealing with an area where uh, transit servicing is very limited. And we are also dealing with an area where, in the future, be it decades, there's going to be very substantial growth for the area. So when determining a road alignment, we have to take into account, obviously, the longer-term implications of such. So um, the and, and other overarching comment is that we understand the city of Port Coquitlam had very limited resources in determining or coming up with the year alignment options as part of a fairly small study. And um, while they prepared some cost estimates for some of the options they looked at, uh, these were only for comparative reasons. In other words, we cannot rely on them entirely. And more importantly, the cost exercise they got into in a very short, uh, limited way uh, dealt only with the cost for the roadways within the city. 
In other words, they did not look at the overall potential options and the overall costs between uh, the two cities for the project or project options themselves. And this is very important to know because um, when it comes to really evaluating the project, I think uh, they should look at the overall costs. Everybody should look at the overall costs. And then, based on that, finding the um, uh, best solution and then uh, discuss who's to pay for what. In our report, we um, described um, a couple of um, requirements by provincial legislation who is to pay for what, at least in theory. Uh, but uh, there could be always exception, exceptions, as well as there are um, some older, probably very outdated, um, specific documentation between the city of Port Coquitlam and the city of Coquitlam as to potential cost sharing of such intermunicipal projects. So having said that, um, for all practical purposes, we have three options uh, on the table. And uh, for some of the general reasons I just outlined, option number one, which is the BC Hydro alignment and continuing onto the Fremont Street existing road right away within the city of Coquitlam would be um, city of Coquitlam's staff recommendation as technically probably the best option at this point in time. Option number two, in order of priority, from our perspective again, is um, the Devon Street alignment, which would then go up to, from Prairie to Lincoln, uh, west on Lincoln, and then uh, join to, to Fremont. I need to mention that because of the limited scope of the POCO, initial POCO study, they did not analyze the entire uh, length of this option. And then the third option is the Cedar Drive option which is um, basically from uh, Prairie Avenue, uh, west of Fremont, uh, along Cedar, and uh, somewhere uh, near Victoria Drive would join into either directly Victoria, but more likely uh, Fremont. So these are the three options. Um, there are, um, for, for some of the options, there are uh, right away uh, consequences, there are cost implications, there are quality of living, consequences, and for some of them there are also environmental uh, options. So nevertheless, um, these are the three options, and uh, staff is recommending to um, respond to Port Coquitlam that uh, this is the ranking of our projects. Thank you. Thank you. Me and then Craig. Okay. First off, um, in the fall, I had um, met with some people that live in that area and um, in the course of my business, and they were talking about all these options. And I guess Port Coquitlam had had some map or something out, and they were all concerned about changes and that. And I said, these were all under discussion, and um, I'm sure that the city engineers would work things out. But a couple of things um, I think that we have to keep in mind is that when the Dominion Triangle, as they're calling it, went in, um, business such as Walmart, which is of course a trendsetter for, for us realtors when we're, when we're looking at where people are gonna be moving to, um, they move in and they do a study of a whole area and they rely on the fact that our population on Burke Mountain is going to be using that Dominion Triangle as is the owner of Canadian Tire, whom I know that's, that was a big consideration for, for us. And um, so Burke Mountain, um, it, I guess it can be considered a plague on, on Port Coquitlam in that area, or it can be considered a blessing because without that additional um, uh, residential area and folks to shop, then the Dominion Triangle wouldn't have been there. So there's been quite a, bonus of money go into Port Coquitlam through that. So when we start talking about money to uh, to look at the options and that, I think we're only going to have one chance to do this right. And my biggest problem there comes in, when you go up Cedar Drive, you have that huge ditch. I forget what creek it is, but it's right beside Cedar Drive. And then behind it, we have where um, we have farmlands. 
So are there any ALR lands that we're going to have to deal with in here as well, just on the additional options? Um, like the first, the old options, there were they, they had already dealt with that. But are there any new additional ALR lands we're going to have to deal with? My limited understanding is that there were <clears throat> previous options, uh, which I believe we shared with Council late last year, uh, where a proposed section of Devon, the Devon Street alignment north of Lincoln would have trespassed um, uh, ALR. But this option is not shown um, on the information we lately received from uh, Port Coquitlam. Okay. So if, if, if I could just add on to that, the initial, <coughs> the initial options that they showed showed the extension of Devon through Coquitlam, which would have bisected the ALR, would have had an, meant a number of creek crossings. Right. And our, our letter back to them uh, said we didn't think we could support that because so go it, west it looked, and up. It yep. looked so, so if uh, you were picking the Devon option, we would recommend you go west a long length and then up yes. the boundary road. Uh, what they did in response to that input was simply not show any options on the Coquitlam side. Right. So they just looked at the poor Coquitlam side. And so uh, we are assuming that, uh, uh, that they are agreeing with us to do that jog uh, to connect it up. But they didn't show it and didn't uh, say anything along those lines. One of the recommendations that we're making is before you finalize this, you have to look at the entirety of everything. So well, and that's that going to be stuff. my next point. We are going to have to build a fairly substantial um, sports amenity up there of some, of some sort, outdoor sports and indoor sports. Um, we are also going to have to take into consideration that we need another east-west crossing of the, of the Coquitlam River, whether it be at Lincoln or Lougheed or wherever it ends up going. Um, all of those things, I think, have to, to mash into it. My biggest concern is, is when you're driving out in that area on Cedar Drive and around Devon and that, our options aren't very many without creating havoc with everything. So I think whatever we do, I, I'm just concerned that we, we really do some long-term thinking on this because we're only going to be able to get it right once. And if we're going to have to displace a few people, um, as sad as that is, hopefully we can reorg folks in the same neighborhoods or whatever we have to do. But um, I don't think we can sort of go second best on this. I think we have to really get in and hold all our feet to the fire and do it right. That's all the uh, comment I have. Uh, none of our first two um, selections displace anybody. And that's good. That's good. But we're going to have 25,000 people going to Walmart on Saturday morning. Um, they're going to have to go somewhere. So. Let's make sure we get a big road. Craig? I'm, I'm worried about the flow through traffic, the commuter traffic coming through here, more than I'm worried about uh, Burke Mountain residential traffic. I think uh, the big issue is that, uh, that the Dominion Triangle is uh, developing into a major uh, retail destination with uh, Walmart, uh, Costco's down in that area, Home Depot, Canadian Tire. I mean, I stand at the end of my street at uh, the corner of Glenbrook and David on a Saturday, and I just see the cars coming over the David Bridge, heading down Coast Meridian. Um, on a, and and that, that, those are days, those are those are residents from uh, the northeast part of Coquitlam, Port Moody area. People that don't want to use the low heat to get to that area because of congestion, and they're coming up and around. And 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 as the retail development grows in that area, we're going to. Port Coquitlam is going to attract more and more people into that area, including people coming from the north. Uh, so many will be Burke Mountain residents, but to me, the big question is: is how are we going to move this traffic through through Coquitlam and through uh, through Port Coquitlam to get to that destination? I know there's a, a thought that all the people in Burke Mountain are just going to use that to come down to the freeway or to the Mary Hill Bypass, and that's not the case. That people are coming to the Dominion Triangle. And we've got to figure out the best the best route to get them there. Um, I'm curious as to uh, staff is not supporting the, the Cedar Drive option, which I guess would be the the cheapest option for us because the whole thing is in Port Coquitlam. Um, having lived in that area for a couple of years, I know some of the challenges there. But I'm just wondering, you didn't outline sort of 
with the concerns. You said that was the sort of the, the least preferred option, but maybe you could sort of explain why the Cedar Drive option is not good from our perspective. We um, looked at um, the three options uh, primarily from the perspective of um, uh, which would ultimately serve best the uh, already established and future um, uh, desire lines. Mm -hmm. And if I look at the um, future grid system, <coughs> um, it appeared that uh, developing uh, for the future additional capacity along the uh, Fremont Street um, would be um, uh, a good, good option. Mm -hmm. uh, also, there is um, information in our um, strategic transportation plan uh, supporting the same information. And I guess the challenge is as we push David through for, for, for our development, uh, people are going to be looking for a way to connect David down. Right now, they cut off at Coast Meridian, but as they, they're looking for a route to go further down, I mean, somebody who goes down to those stores, myself, I see the traffic coming down Coast Meridian. I see them cutting through the, uh, by Terry Fox School through the back way. And, and, you know, traffic is starting to flood their neighborhoods. So I, I think that certainly they have got to find a way to move traffic into that uh, industrial park uh, and retail complex. And we're going to have to be part of that, uh, that solution. And, uh, and the, the Devon one worries me in that how we're going to get from the top of the corner of Devon and Lincoln over to the corner of Victoria and Cedar Drive. Uh, and, and that's the part, when I look at this, that's missing because, uh, and, and the other thing is I, I really don't want to see a whole lot of jogs and right turns because that's, that's the route that's right now. That's the route that I take. I go along Victoria Drive down Cedar in off of Burns or I go down Coast Meridian and I, I cut through a residential neighborhood, which I, I don't want to, to do that. I don't want to see commuter traffic coming through our residential neighborhoods to get down to that in, uh, retail development either. And uh, I'm uh, hoping that uh, we can uh, move quickly to, uh, to find a solution. And as, uh, as was outlined earlier, the other, the, along Victoria and along Lincoln, because those, uh, all those uh, roads are going to uh, lead uh, to either our um, SkyTrain station or their retail development. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, just on the, I know we're looking at the alignment. I, I think, as you point out, the hydro is the more direct and proper alignment to go through whether POCO chooses that or not, but I read in the report and it's, they're still not clear whether POCO will ever get the clearance from the ALR because that section from Prairie to Lincoln is still needs ALR uh, approval, I'm not correct, is that? Um, unfortunately, I don't have a 100% recollection, but this issue surfaced uh, between the two cities at a uh, meeting earlier. Uh, and. Um, I, I don't exactly recall. Um, uh, it, it's kind of a special zone within the ALR, as I understand. So at the time, um, the um, uh, agricultural land reserve approval uh, was kind of downplayed. But unfortunately, I don't have a 100% recollection. I know there's been people east of Cedar for years have been wanting to take their land out for development and told that it, they wouldn't take it due to ALR concerns. So it's just um, in Port Putin. So that's just something I think we need to know and need to find out on that one there. What's, what's the situation on that piece there? Because the hydro right away would be already allowed because there's already right away registered on the ALR land for that probable use would be easier to get through. Uh, just to add, I, I think the Devon Light connection follows an existing road. Is that not right, Captain? Uh, she was answering some questions that I had earlier on that. So uh, I don't think there's any ALR considerations on the Devon connection, is there? There is none? No. It's an existing road on this. And it's actually open. Okay. It'll just be widened. Is there ALR anywhere? North of Lincoln. Uh, Around it. Uh, I'm just comparing the, the map we have in patch attachment three here with the map that uh, Port Coquitlam has on its uh, website. And um, for the BC Hydro alignment, um, it's actually got a completely straight line with no curve in it. That's almost, I think it's right, it's between the BC Hydro line uh, right away and Fremont, it appears, it's just right next to Fremont. 
Is that your understanding as well? Or is our map more actually more detailed than their map? No, actually, the, the map what you have in attachment three is only schematic, uh -huh. so we don't deal with um, small details. Okay. Um, but their map actually shows it almost right along Fremont. Um, not the right of way, but anyway, that's fine. The other, the other thing that they say is that, okay. uh, and I want to get clarification here, um, they say very clearly, the city, Port Coquitlam, has no immediate plans to construct any portion of this route. Mm -hmm. And um, does the city of Coquitlam have a preference for how soon this should be built? Is it going to be talking with Port Coquitlam about a timetable? Uh, or do we have a, a, um, a preferred timetable that, we, that we're going to present to them? Uh, since right now they've got no plans for any construction, it's all just theoretical at this stage. Well, from from my perspective, um, I think the uh, city of Coquitlam's approach is that uh, we are not looking at uh, the Fremont options uh, on its own. Uh, what we are looking at is other interconnections between Poco and Coquitlam and we would like to reach a longer term understanding between the two cities as to the priorities of these projects and uh, how we should jointly proceed with one or another. And uh, uh, we just started this process very late last year. So um, so this is one piece in a jigsaw puzzle that involves Lincoln Avenue and <coughs> correct. maybe that's the other and, big piece. And we have no money set up in any of our current funding models for this program. Okay. okay, thank you. Do you want to add anything? Um, I move receipt of the report. Second. Moved by Councilor Angelo, second by Councilor Anderson. All in favor? So just to summarize, we will be sending the attached letter to them uh, later today, and then that will be a quick most formal input into the process at this point. And we will have further discussions on all the other projects and how everything fits together at some later stage. Uh, Mr. Chair, just before we continue further, I, I thought we should make mention of the fact that uh, item five, uh, the draft housing affordability framework in progress report has been deferred until next week in case there were there were people here or people online uh, waiting for that particular report to come forward Thank you. Make sure that. Um, next item item three concerns the city of the archives annual report for 2014 um, the reports for you for information i just ask Emily to come forward as um, the face of our archives um, this is the uh, I draw your attention to the copy that is here, and, and we will be posting a copy of this online. Um, this is our second annual report, but our first full year report. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Emily for her hard work to bring the archives so far so quickly, and uh, at, particularly at this stage of its development where there's a lot of foundational work uh, taking place, and that's represented in the annual report. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Lauren Hewson, who Emily reports to, and, and the work that Lauren has done on this behalf as well. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, our internal partners, especially uh, ICT and communications. Uh, as you note from the report, uh, having a, a presence, a digital presence, and also the work of digital records requires great cooperation from our um, ICT department. And uh, I know Emily joins me saying we can't thank them enough for, for what they've done. Um, and you'll see that expressed in things like our web page that, that talks about that and our our a quest, which is our internal ability to search the records. Think of a library system uh, in which you're looking for discrete items. Um, it also speaks to our ability to reach users both internal to Coquitlam and outside of Coquitlam. Uh, by having such an online presence, we can be part of things like Memory BC, which is a portal for all of archives in BC. And if people go in there because they don't know to go in through Coquitlam, they'll still end up back at our holdings. And that's a great way of um, uh, extending our outreach and our reach uh, for the records. Um, the report talks about a few acquisition highlights. Um, this is a, a postcard from a, a wife during the First World War to her, to her husband, and uh, uh, he subsequently died at 
Vimy Ridge uh, later in the war, but it's just written months before he was deployed overseas. And what this does is it helps bring um, events of, of our past to a personal level and allow people to connect and, and relate to people directly. And uh, uh, or photos of what's happening down at, at Colony Farm in 1914 and uh, speaks to some of our holdings, including glass plate negatives, which are um, a bit rare and uh, a unique type of uh, medium, uh, which, we're, which we're proud to have. And this came through our Riverview Historical Society collection, which is also acknowledged uh, in the report up to the present. And uh, you know, we look at things like Town Centre Park and, and all the great amenities it offers to our citizens and residents and indeed the Metro Vancouver area in general. And at one point, it didn't exist as, as we see it now. And this, the, the archives allows all of us to, to understand the story of how that came about, uh, look at initial designs. Um, and I, I'll even go back to the report we just had about Fremont. You know, 20 years from now or whenever, people look at it and it's like, it's as if the street was always there and they don't understand some of the, the, the things that came into play. Another key part of outreach uh, is Lest We Forget, which is a project that uh, Emily and I, who both came from a Library and Archives Canada background, uh, it, they worked on uh, with a small community in Ontario to begin with, Smith Falls. Um, and we are trying to, to bring that out here, again, to bring the stories to life of those in Coquitlam who served uh, Canada overseas and, and many of whom paid the ultimate sacrifice doing so. Um, our initial plan was to work with the school board and indeed the library and, and work with high school students. Um, and the idea being that we can access the digital files of, of those soldiers from Coquitlam who died in the war and tell a bit more about their background and again make, make them real. Um, because of the, uh, the job action in the, in the school district, we weren't able to proceed with the school board as first plan. Um, and what Emily was able to do, and I, I, I thank her for this, for the initiative, is, is to work with Douglas College and go to some of their first year history programs. And, and what you see before you is uh, some of the um, uh, project work of, of students in the class who, uh, who really ran with the idea. And I think you may have seen a letter that we recently received from the professor there, um, totally not um, asked for. And, uh, no. <laughs> timing is just coincidence. <laughs> and, uh, but we're, we're very pleased to see the response of the students. And uh, I, I think one of the things that both the professor and Emily noted was it's hard to engage the students in that first year and, and you know, history is the past. And what this really did was uh, speak to them on a personal level. I think we saw that in the quality of project work that they did. Um, one of the things I wanted, oh, maybe just before I leave Acquis, uh well, I'll come back to it. Uh, one of the things we wanted to talk to you about is, is some of our digital outreach. And one of the things we do is throw back Thursday. Um, we send out an image from our archives and you'll see an example there. We use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our internal cork board. Um, I think it sparks a reaction and uh, a positive one and, and gives an idea to the breadth of our holdings and uh, as people who are most connected connected to our community, especially through social media, we hope that uh, um, you are retweeting or, or doing those things that, that extend that outreach further into people that you're connected with because we want, we want to make these records more, uh, more well known and, uh, and thus used. Um, and uh, you know, Emily uses some uh, a great thought into what goes into Throwback Thursday and uh, the Thursday before the election happened to be an election return from an election in the past, uh, <laughs> showing all the poll by poll results and, and stuff like that. It's, uh, it's really quite interesting and, and speaks to the currency of archives to speak to the present. It's not just about the past. Um, like last year, we did a conservation project in this year. Last year, we, we did the letters patent from one of our letters patent. Um, what we're doing this year is we're working with um, the same company um, to look at some of our oldest records. And these are cash journals and tax assessment rolls right back to 1891. Um, again, helping to bring the records to life. You can, probably can't quite see it from the distance, but uh, halfway down that list, I think you're seeing um, records relate to the paying of the Gazette, which would have paid for the announcement of the first council elections, because in 1891, we were granted letters patent in July. The first elections were in late August, I believe. August and these uh, financial records are from October. So when you think of the turnaround of receipt, and near the bottom of that is buying the first uh, seal for the city of Coquitlam, and who we bought it from, and what it would have cost. Mm -hmm. So again, um, bringing that introduction of democracy and uh, uh, representation by population to Coquitlam alive and, and we're quite proud of that. Um, work is ongoing. Uh, we've got lots of successes. The, uh, the archives is, is 
is full, as the report will note too. Uh, but we're also continuing to acquire records, and uh, many councillors here, again, your, your, your connections in the community have helped us, whether it be with Northeast Ratepayers Association, and we talked about Eagle Ridge Ratepayers Association and, uh, and other groups that you may be connected with. Uh, you know, we'll start to approach sports teams, whether it's about the Sharks or the Adnax or other groups like that, that go back in and speak to um, a rich part of our community. And uh, this week, we're in the process of finalizing what will probably be our largest acquisition to date. And uh, we're not quite ready to speak to full details on that, but we're really excited and some, uh, uh, some announcements will be made in the near future. And I think it just really speaks a little bit to the idea, and uh, <coughs> you don't want to over-exaggerate, but a little bit of, of build it and they will come. Because what people need is they need a place of trust to give their most valuable possessions and they need to trust the person doing it, and Emily has been fantastic at that. But they also need to trust that there is um, some place better than their attic to put them in, and, uh, and that we are in, engaged in, in helping to preserve it for, um, for forever. And uh, so we're, we're quite pleased. We um, think there's lots of good news here, and we're really looking forward to the year ahead. And uh, again, I'd like to thank Emily for all her work on that regard. Excellent, thanks. I've got some really old election brochures that would be really funny to put on. Um, on Throwback Thursday, the person who was doing my campaign during the election, I sent them a 25-year-old picture of when Town Centre Park was just being dug up. And my comment was, this is me in front of Town Centre Park. It's really grown and so have I. <laughs> it was, I couldn't believe, I mean, the, the difference, you know, in, my, when I see something like this, like the first payment to the Gazette or something, I think these would make wonderful little postcards. And especially for our 125th uh, birthday coming up, I think it would be fun to have a collection of postcards from just some of these old documents. And I just sort of wanted to throw that out. I can see how enthused you are, Jay. You just love this one. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of neat to, to look at it all. but. I would really like to see postcards made of some of this, and maybe the, whoever's running the 125th birthday thing could, we could incorporate it somehow, to have them for sale or give them away or something. Um, and uh, Emily can say more about it than I, but she's been involved in some of the initial discussions, and she is um, thinking of the program of uh, what archives can roll out. She's looking, I think, trying to develop a chronology of what happened each day during uh, 365 days. entries. Yeah. Yes. Trying, I think I'm at 187, yeah. so I have a year to go. Yeah. <laughs> but, it's but yeah, we great. want to do that too. We we. I mean, I both believe strongly that uh, uh, archives can help inform the present, and uh, uh, you know from from both policy work, you know, how what's the background of some of these decisions that we're, we're looking at now, to uh, just a, a greater appreciation of, of those who came well, before us and help them this blue. Yeah. yeah, because the bigger the world gets, the more community people want to, to glue themselves into. Yeah. Find that identity and uh, um, we, we think it resonates and uh, we're, we want more of that too. Yeah. Thank you more for your work. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Brent, then Craig, then Richard. Well, thank you for the report. Good. I'm glad to see. I think, you know, I don't know. We probably don't have the space to bring in all the collections that we could bring in. Um, but I do know when we talk about telling our story, and I know what when we brought in the Northeast information for the ratepayers, did we also have a person in the Northeast who was researching a book on the history and is going around finding the old timers? So it's, it becomes an asset for other people to help tell our story and bring our history back to life in different forms. Without this, though, it makes it very difficult for people to find the information, research that can cr create that central. Um, this one person is going out, and he will, he's been in contact, will be coming back and trying to bring back some information also. I do thank Councillor McDonnell for his foresight a number of years ago. As we, we hired a photographer that sits on council now. <laughs> and to take the photographs of Burke Mountain as it changes for future generations. I think it's a great foresight that we should be doing more of that just on Burke Mountain throughout the city so that we can catalog that change in the system. And I think that was a good foresight on Burke Mountain, but I think it's something I know Craig's been doing parts of that for a while now. And I think it's, as we go along, it's somebody else to continue doing that. I think it's really important to have something like that go on. Thank you. Speaking of the photographer. 
Well, somebody who has a has a passion for uh, for history and, and heritage here, I, I think it's just uh, fantastic that we we finally do have a city archives. When we uh, when we established the archive two years ago, we were the largest city in British Columbia that didn't have one. So uh, mm -hmm. I think it's important that we have that we made those steps. Mm -hmm. And I, and as you alluded to, I think that the main thing about once you have a city archive, people will start to turn over information because they feel they feel safe in knowing that it's now in the proper hands. And and so long, it's so many years and, and that I was out in the community with various heritage groups there were there were collections out there that people were reluctant to turn over because they they didn't know that they would be protected forever because you know volunteers do great work in the community but but this uh, gives some uh, permanency to uh, to these collections and we know that they will be uh, treated with uh, with best practice, and, and I think we're you know we're certainly very fortunate to have you and, and Jay, who uh, comes from a background in archives, and so uh, that's been instrumental in getting this going. And uh, uh, I, I do have a few of the old photos that are going to find their way over to the uh, to the archives. And it's interesting when I look at some of my old photos and pictures of uh, the trailer parks here in this area and to see how the city has changed. And 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 a lot of people have pictures in their uh, in their attics and family photo albums. And when the time comes that they're moving, they don't know what to do with those pictures and I think that's important to get the word out that there is a place that these can be preserved for uh, for the rest of uh, the residents of Coquitlam and for, for future generations to, to look back on and uh, and I'm really excited about the uh, the new material that's that's coming over I know it's a it's a huge collection I look forward to the to the day we can announce that and make that available to the public Richard yeah I saw some boxes this morning uh, of stuff I <laughs> pretended to help. That's what I normally do is pretend to help. Um, uh, and a, to, from my perspective, it's not just the preservation of these, but to the ability of the community to celebrate um, and to, to see it. And so I, I, I think we have to find those engaging ways, whether it's postcards. I would love to see some of this stuff be used as the um, hydro box wrap or the signal switch wrap uh, in, in Millardville, some of our hair, well, certainly up uh, up North Road. Um, Burnaby has done some of that with some heritage photos. I think uh, it, we should be trying to copy the good practices that other communities have done ahead of us um, and to make them better. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm now more excited about the archives than I was when, when it was the concept was first presented by someone who tried to con who really had to work to convince perhaps us to, to, to throw that much dedication into this. Um, uh, because uh, I now have some, found some documents in the, in the basement that I'll be uh, bringing over. Uh, they're, not as, they're, not, they're not as old, but they're uh, related to some of the history of, say, the, the swim club 50 years ago. Uh, I know the Wing Shark Swim Club has some documents that I want them to come over here when we did the 50th anniversary of the Sharks. They were laid out in front of us, and we all had glasses of water, probably some other beverage. Um, and you're almost, yeah, yeah, you, can, you, can, you can see someone saying, ah, no, 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 cake, no, no, no birthday cake near the documents. Um, we but, celebrate our stereotypes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, to me, um, let's get them preserved, but let's also get them out there. Throwback Thursday and other social media mechanisms or whatever in order to try to create that sense of identity or rather to strengthen the sense of identity by seeing the documents. The last comment is I, I loved the project of going out and taking a picture of something and then remembering the spot, driving a nail or whatever mm -hmm. and reshooting. Um, I'd like to see us, I was flipping through one of these documents and it was this one, at one of the pictures of uh, uh, Colony Farm looking up the hill at West Lawn as it was under construction. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. And I'd love yeah. to go back to that spot okay. and shoot that again today. Um, I'd love to see us recreate some of the, uh, throw a sepia tone on the, on the recreation of it perhaps okay. so that we can compare in, in the same color the change of our community from that, that perspective. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm excited. I'm not as excited as Jake. <laughs> well, I think the council took um, a great step, and it, it, it's hard to make a, a commitment until you see it, right? It's abstract until it becomes real, and I think uh, one of the great things that Emily has done is worked really hard to make it real um, for you, for us, and for the residents, and uh, quite proud of the work that she's done. She's really taken the ball and run with it, and, uh, and 
the report speaks for itself and all the work that's been done. And I'd just like to pick up a bit of a theme that, that all of the speakers mentioned um, about um, access. And, and it really is about that democracy of access. I think in the past, people knew who to see to find that one item to help their one project. By bringing in the archives and making it known to all, I think it, it, it just increases that. Not just, it's not transparency, it's democratic access to the record that's not controlled by a party that may want to have control over it and, uh, and not for nefarious reasons, just because they don't want people coming to their home <laughs> every week. Um, and I think the archives uh, is, is great for that and I look forward to even more work being done about our, our different areas of the I just want to share a little personal anecdote regarding this archives and commend you on the, the job well done. When I was reading this last night, I discovered that I live, I live in an older part of Coquitlam and I learned that I live on a street named after a soldier that passed away in 1917 in the war. So I thought, oh, that's very interesting. I didn't know that. So I shared that with my kids and we adopted our street to pick up the litter sometime last year and it hit them. My kids are 13 and 11. And they said, well, if we live on a street named after a man who died in the war, for us, then we have to keep it clean. So I'm sharing that with you to tell you, I'm not trying to say anything about my kids, but what I'm saying is access to this kind of information can have such a positive impact in ways that you may not even think about. People might view a site differently or learn something that just gives them that extra bit of respect towards the history of people before us. So. I kind of took it all, it's all great, but I took it kind of from that point of view as well. That's wonderful. So That's just, actually um, the Less We Forget project. That that brings it home for students. Oftentimes they can connect with a soldier on a very personal level. And um, if I assume you live on Windrum? I live in Montgomery. Oh, I'm Montgomery. Yeah, so okay. it's the one right on the, this picture here. Right. Oh, oh, I'll, 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 let, I'll let Erica know. <laughs> I'll pass that on. <laughs> Just quickly, are you at this point, I would wonder if you're going out to places like Dogwood and the Legion and Glen Pine and to uh, Centre Bellage, those four places would be excellent. I would love them to know how far you've come with this and they're the folks that are going to have the pictures tucked away. I have a presentation scheduled at Dogwood in February and Glen Pine in March. And, and Centre Bellage would be a wonderful one. And as would the Legion, believe it or not. The Legion would be a good place to go to. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I would like, if you're going to do it, let's do it up well. We agree. Thank you very much. That's Thank you. Move to receive. Second. Moved by Councillor Sorrell, second by Councillor Hill. All in favor? Opposed? Sorry, I, yeah, just sorry, I, I put my hand up just, just before you called the vote, but it, <coughs> that, that street naming thing, I used to own, and I probably still do somewhere, that book by, who was the guy in Vancouver that had every street name identified and explained about 40 years ago. Uh, oh, really? Oh, I know, yeah. Um, um, six letters. Uh, can't think of it. But anyway, Davis, sorry, it was Davis. Chuck. Chuck Davis. And um, right. is there that kind of a plan to try to figure out we know that Edgar was named after. We know that Pare, we know the streets, Marmont was a former uh, uh, mayor or former council member. Um, how do we get, do we have that project on the, on the plan? Uh, it, uh, it's a spot shop planning development, so I'd like to acknowledge the work of Jim's department. And uh, there's, um, I believe, a report coming in the, in the near future on that. Um, and a little bit of that is both uh, uh, capturing what we know from the past, um, but also putting forward names that, that may be best to use in the future. And I think one of the things that Emily has uh, really uh, championed is, is our, our, all of our um, um, veterans who, who were killed in action uh, recognized in the city. So Emily's been going in and looking at that. And so we'll develop a register to um, help uh, those who are working on street names. And Jim's group um, have already talked about building um, one for the entire city and, and that, we could, that we could fill in over time, right? Some of them are are chosen for different reasons, but uh, I know Jim, Jim's group has already started some work on that front. And, and along those veins, um, there there's a half dozen names that were really big in 50 years ago in the Burke Mountain celebration of the mountain, you know, the, the cabins up there, the Filiatro and Gamashes and those. Um, but there's also a, a, a great many of our, our, our early pioneers that never did get recognized. Is that, is, is that 
a potential street name sort of thing. Some of the pioneers of Burke Mountain in the residential side, the pioneer farmers, some of them have like Crouch and those that have the streets already, but some of them didn't. And I wonder if that's doable. Uh, a very timely question, Your Worship. <laughs> uh, we've been working on that report. It's uh, almost ready to go. Uh, in fact, one of you need to do this down with Jay to talk about this uh, division of responsibilities. Uh, Understanding of what the street name register might be. And I think there's some differing views on that. I think we just got to come together for a common understanding. Um, yes, we, we've tried to be uh, uh, complete, inclusive, kept capturing all those names, um, have a historic reference, and uh, they're available for street naming purposes. But we're preparing a policy for council's consideration. Um, it was essentially to reinforce what we're doing now, but with more clarity and certainty. And um, sort of taking it to the next level and making sure that those things that you mentioned or listed in the past are not lost and you know, captured. And really understand what the, what the uh, significance or importance of those names are. What is, what is that little thing of the history around that name? So that's what we need to talk with the staff and some of the uh, stakeholders. That should be coming forward to council in the next month or so. Sorry. So that. Uh, Moving a receipt of report was moved by Councilor Zarello, seconded by Councilor O'Neill. Let's try that again. All in favor? Deferred. Thank you very much. Yeah. It's, we're the twilight zone of procedure there between two items. Uh, next report, item four, um, is a report of General Manager's Strategic Initiatives and speaks to the City Center Civic Campus Thermonex system construction <coughs> completion and the reports before you for information. Move recommendation. Second. Um, sorry, Councilor you want to? Yeah, question. Yes. Um, the uh, the uh, City Center Civic Campus Thermonex system uh, was, uh, was explained to us at the Two benefits: one, a, a more tangible, immediate benefit of uh, reducing carbon emissions. The other one, um, as all of our uh, uh, so many other uh, upgrades in our system, has said eventually it will save some money as well. And um, I think every, everything else has come before us in the last three years anyway. There's been a quick turnaround turn uh, uh, for like five years or ten years or something like that until it pays for itself. I recall that the Thermnex system, though, this was a l much longer uh, projection um, um, for, for when it would pay for itself. There was a lot of upfront expense, but the savings would be a little bit every year, and finally after 15 or 20 years or something, it would pay for itself. Uh, now that the price of uh, natural gas and oil and gasoline and everything like that is going down, I know that uh, fuel prices are going down, does this mean that um, the, have, have there been any calculations made about if indeed this will ever this will pay for itself now? Because our projections on when it would pay for itself are based on much higher fuel prices than are currently out there. Um, through the chair, uh, calculations have not been done to date. Um, it's a bit premature to be doing those calculations at this time, uh, as as council is aware, oil fluctuates up and down over a period of time. Um, we don't know how long this uh, low oil price situation will continue on. Um, we've committed through the Engineering Public Works Department to bring back a report in about a year, and uh, that will be taken into consideration at that time. We'll have a year under our belt of operating, a bit more than a year, and um, we'll know more at that time. These things just fluctuate, and we just need some time to evaluate that. Yeah, I was, if there is indeed going to end up being a, a long-term financial commitment to this that it's going to have to essentially be subsidized and won't pay for itself at the end of, uh, by the end of its life uh, taxpayers should know that there'll be a report coming back to council with that information thank you you're welcome uh, Councilor Zerlo? I guess if we're going that route then we should also make the public aware of the savings in the GHG emissions because that was one of the goals of the project was not just the price but also the 30 percent projection so we just want to make sure that we're doing the and that, that report will be comprehensive and will include both objectives if if I think there were some other objectives as well it'll, it'll be comprehensive 
I, and while I, I wasn't going to mention, but now I've got, I just want you to know I have awesome and congratulations checked out from here. Really good job getting it done so quickly and hardly any disruption to uh, okay. the regular workings of Thank City you. Hall. Yeah. One day my parking space wasn't available. So we, uh, we had two people who received. Did you catch that earlier? Yes, Councillor Aspinson and Councillor Hodge. Great. All in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, Mr. Chair, with the deferral of item five, uh, this, uh, this agenda is completed. We have no other formal business. Move adjourn. Second. second. Councillor Aspinson, second by Councillor O'Neill. All in favor? Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes.